This will be our 34th lesson in the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in the third chapter, verses 10 and 11. This is a very uh, weighty section of Scripture. Now, when people approach the subject of salvation or man's identity with God, they generally deal with obligations, what, what men are supposed to do. Like how they, what must they do to be saved and how should they live and so forth. And of course there's a place, there's a place for this they're necessary to know. But those things are largely addressed to the unconverted and the novice. Very rarely is anyone of mature age addressed in that way in Scripture. They'll be told, forget not to be charitable, you know, don't forget to entertain strength, things like that. But an extended detail on how you ought to live, that's generally teaching for beginners. At some point, <coughs> the person who's been experientially reconciled, and what I mean by experientially reconciled is that some people are reconciled to God, but they don't, they don't see it that clearly yet. And to be experientially reconciled means you're reconciled and you know it. That, that's what we're talking about. People who are experientially reconciled to God have got to come to know what God intends to do in saving them. Like, why did he do it? Why did he save the people? That's what needs to be known. It was salvation the aim? Or was it a means to the aim? See, that's what has to be established. Why is this so? <coughs> God has arranged salvation so that if you don't know what's going on, you won't get there. Yeah. Amen. Anymore than if you didn't know the way to Springfield, you'd get there. This is the way salvation is. So to get started, you really don't need to know a whole lot to get started. But now to stay on the road, that, that's another matter. This kind of knowledge, knowing what God intends, it's just, we're not just speaking of intellectual knowledge, like you read it in a book, this is what he wants to do, and so forth. It's not, not like, quite like that. When you know what God is doing in salvation, it creates kind of an inner compulsion that, that drives you to do the things of God. The reason why people are in and out and up and down, slothful and hot and cold and all that, is they don't know what's going on. That's what the trouble is. We don't, uh, we're not going to criticize them, be hard on them. But this has to change. Be long suffering for a while, but then there comes a time this is out of order. Well, that's why Paul said, to the Hebrew believers, by the reason of time, you ought to be teachers. You know, you ought, to, you ought to be conversed enough that somebody could come to you and learn instead of you always having to go to someone else and learn. You, there comes that time's got to come. But what I'm saying is that time can't come unless you do know, in fact, what God is doing in salvation. Now, Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example in this. He knew why he came. <laughs> He knew not just that he ought to come. He, just, he knew more that he had to come or that he was sent. He's praying to God one time. He said, what shall I say? Save me from this hour, but for this cause came I to this hour. Yeah, See, John 12, 27. He knew why I was here. He stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, what's truth? He says, well, my, he, my kingdom's out of the world. He says, uh, for this cause came I into the world to bear witness to the truth. See, he knew what. He knew why I was here. Amen. Paul knew why he was an apostle. 
to open men's eyes, turn them from darkness to light, the power of Satan unto God. He knew why he was here. He wasn't here to resolve the dilemmas of people. Now, this was Moses had this ministry. <laughs> well, it was a burdensome one, too. Can you imagine a body of people about the size of the city of Chicago haggling around with one another and arguing about one another and every dispute they had? They didn't just duke it out. They took it to Moses. Finally, it got, got too much. Well, just in the city of Chicago go alone, there's hundreds of judges and thousands of lawyers. Huh? There was one with Israel. <laughs> but then he had so much spirit, the Lord took some of his spirit and put on 70 men. And their sole job was to settle these various disputes. But Paul knew that's not that's not why I'm here. Even though there were some things he did enter into, but He'd say something like, uh, you two over there in Colossae, get along, will you? That was his word to him. Tell him to, tell him to get along. Not to be fussing all the time. So Paul knew he was here to open up salvation. He knew that's what, that's what it was here. So if you ask him if it was right, if, you, if he would cast his vote for Caesar, he probably wouldn't answer you. That isn't what he was here for. In celebration of the election, I had a mind to write an article, but I haven't done it yet. Don't vote for Nebuchadnezzar, but I, I, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> Daniel didn't do that because he knew who set kings up. Now, just by way of passing, God hadn't changed the kingdom so that people set him up now. So Paul's opening up this text, opening up what he knows he want, he's been sent to do, make men see. Quite an assignment. You ever tried to do that? You ever tried to make somebody see? Someone didn't understand the things of God, and you engaged an effort to try and make them see? <laughs> oh, that's a large work, but that's what he was given to do, make men see. Some might say, well, you can't make anybody see. Well, Paul said, I was sent to make men see. That's my ministry. Make them see. All it requires is that they pay attention. Yeah. They just pay attention. When I get through, they'll see. Quite a ministry. Now, here's something to know. That, note to the why of salvation. Why did God do it? This kind of knowledge is not intuitive. When you're born again, you don't learn this. It's just not built in the new creation, so the new creature just knows it. That's not the way it is. Some things are like that. Some things you just intuitively know. This is right, this is wrong. But this, God's purpose, that's something. You've got to be taught that by somebody who was told it by God. In this case, as Paul and the means he's using to transmit it to us is the script are the scriptures. And even then, when even even with the scriptures, you've got to have God open them up to you too. That's why Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 7, consider what I say. And the Lord give you understanding in all things. He said, <laughs> so you've got to hear it or read it, think about it, and then God will open it up to you. So let's look at what the what he's going to say about why, why we've been reconciled, why we've been saved. To the intent. To the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, there are no small number of Christians 
who do not know those verses are in the Bible. They've never heard them, never heard anyone quote them, never heard them read, never had them covered in a, quote, Sunday school lesson or one of those infamous quarterlies. Great bodies of people have no idea that those verses are in the Bible. Why not? They've adopted an agenda that doesn't require the utterance of these verses. Why, is there, why aren't these verses preached in church A, B, C, D, all over the place? Why aren't they preached? It's because what the people are doing in that church, what the leaders are doing in that church, do not require this kind of knowledge. So I indict him, and I'm not ashamed to do so. But quite frankly, they're phonies. This has got to be made known. It's going to give a reason now for making all men see. <coughs> Why am I doing this? The words, to the intent, yes, those are intriguing words. They mean for this reason or in order that, for this purpose. It really is a, it's not an exact translation of the word used because there isn't anything really that says it completely, but that's what it means, is that uh, the reason I've been sent to open men's eyes so they can see the mystery is in order that what I'm going to tell you may happen. Now, God hinted at this. This is an index to God's character. Unlike any other God, God has a reason for doing what he does. No other God does. No other God in all the world today has or has ever been held accountable for what they do. They have never been told. They've never told why they do what they do. Allah's never done this. Never given explanation for why. Just said, do it and that's it. No other God does this, but our God does. He said, you'll know on that day that I have done nothing that I have done without cause. I have not done without cause all that I have done. There's a reason why God does everything. Amen. It's not like a knee-jerk reaction. God has reactions. He has reactions to right and wrong, godly and ungodly, but he, his reactions are not like human reactions, not like touching the stove and having to... It's not that type of thing. There's a reason, a cause that drives everything he does. But the catch is, it's not readily apparent. It has to be divulged. This, this aspect or purpose, this purpose, is the purpose of the only true God, as I have said, no and he is distinguished from all other gods because of this. Even Christian gods, even gods the church has invented, and it has invented. They'll say, God does this, God does that. You know enough about God to know, well, God doesn't do that at all. God doesn't care who you are. God doesn't care what you wear. People make statements like this and do not have the faintest idea what they're talking about. They may be talking about a God, but it's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is a cause for what he does. Amen. Everything he does. <laughs> there is, in other words... And incidentally, if he doesn't, this cause is part of himself. It's inherent in his character. So that you can't have God without having his purpose. God doesn't go anywhere where his purpose doesn't go. His purpose is part of him. Part of his character. That's why it could be hidden. Whoever doesn't know God can't know the purpose. 
because it's part of it's part of God. It's not something in his mind. It's part of God. What you say, Brother Gibbon, a lot of what, a lot of what he's doing is revealing himself. That's exactly making himself it. known. <laughs> and what to summarize things from our viewpoint, the, one of the primary reasons for saving us is so we can see what he's doing. Now there's a supreme reason for this work, it's, and it's going to be declared here. It's a purpose that's driving salvation and the proclamation of salvation. Now God's intentions are driven by his will. They are not driven by human need. The people have to see this now. Human need is very interpretive. Some people think they have a need, may not be considered by God a need at all. God may see a need, they don't think it's a need at all. So the thing that determines God's purpose is his will. <coughs> Therefore, we read, God is working all things together. God works all things after the counsel of his own will. See, that's what he's saying. His will determines what he does. In fact, he begat us of his own will by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Because what he does is determined by his will, God is depicted as a builder. He's not a builder working for somebody. <laughs> He's the chief builder, and he, what he builds is what he wants to build. Nothing else. So the scripture says, he that built all things is God. See, that presumes a purpose. Step. I'm laying kind of a foundation here. This presumes he's got a purpose. I built, because you don't build without a purpose. You just don't go out and start banging boards together, nailing them together. You have an objective you got to determine, am I going to build a shed, a barn, a house, a garage, tool shed? <laughs> what am I going to build? A platform, dog house? That's a purpose. So he builds. And he's, uh, he finishes. Gee, that presumes a purpose. The word finish uh, presumes a purpose. He finished. I will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Built and finish. They belong to purpose. They're an aspect of purpose. Amen. Yes. Uh, Jesus revealed that in a parable when he was speaking about the builder. He said, No one sits down to, to build, build his castle without first considering the cost. That's right. And God knew, his, knew, knew that will, knew that cost from start to finish That's before right. he started. That's right. And, and Christ even revealed that to, to the people at that time. <coughs> I think sometimes people, when they think about salvation, they think way down to when they first became aware of God, and, and that's a, like a starting point of their thinking. But you've got to go back, way back, <laughs> way back before that, because God didn't design a special salvation for you. It's a common salvation, right? Jude 1.3, it's a common salvation, not a specially designed one for the individual. And there's a purpose that, listen, if the, if the thing called salvation that a person has doesn't accomplish what God intends, it's not salvation. It's a delusion. That's all it is. And don't you know that there are people that think they are saved, but the product isn't what God intended, so they can't be saved. God doesn't save people without his objective being met. What kind of salvation would that be? The God, the God of salvation, is what you call it. For God to save somebody, but what he get when he gets done, what he designed, that doesn't result, then the person hasn't been saved. It's just that simple. And if the result is met, then the person is saved. That's true, according to purpose. The existence of, a, of, a, of an objective 
is why we read about something being fulfilled. See the idea fulfilled. That means there was there was a, a purpose, an objective that drove the whole thing. One time Jesus said, do you not know that I can call my ask for twelve? My, call my father; he would send twelve legions of angels could deliver him. But how would the scriptures be fulfilled? He knew why he came. That purpose had to be fulfilled. Here's another use of the word "fulfill," which indicates a purpose. This is my point here. Paul said, "I would not you be ignorant that blindness in part has happened to Israel until." The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. All right, the purpose, as is described in Ephesians, is that the Jew and Gentile made together into one body. That's the purpose. So he's, he's tolerant until. <laughs> that purpose drove him driving the whole thing. Yes. That's why the scriptures are able to say that his works have been finished from the, from the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. A word that is used to set forth uh, fulfilled, another word is lest, lest, L-E-S-T. The use of that word presumes something has happened that contradicts this purpose. So we read things like this, exhort one another daily while it's, at, while it's called today, lest, lest. Any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Why do you say that? Because God's purpose made no provision for being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That is not in this salvation, not even at the tail end of it. There's no level of salvation that, that allows for you to be deceived. None. So exhort one another daily, that is, Keep matters clearly before the people so they know what this is all about. Yeah. Lest they be hardened, Amen. rendered incapable of hearing and seeing through the deceitfulness of sin. Because salvation doesn't allow for deceitfulness. If deceitfulness enters in, they're outside the perimeter of salvation. Oh, that people knew this. There are people who don't know this. They teach that people may be deceived, but they're still saved. They're still inside. Well, God knows, but he hasn't taught us to think like that. Deceit comes from the devil. He's the deceiver. Amen. And if a person is being directed by the devil, don't try and tell anybody that that person is saved. Because God, God has a shepherd for the sheep, and it's not the devil. It's simple, and it's, it, you see, well, but their people don't know this. Their theology contradicts this. When something is said to be according to the will of God, it means more than it's the right thing to do. Something that's according to the will of God means that's what God's doing. That blends in with what God has determined he's going to do. Now, it said of David, he served his own generation by the will of God. That's Acts 13, 36. He served his own generation by the will of God. What's that mean? Did he did all, all did the right thing? Well, it, he did do right things, but that means when he finished his life, he got done what God intended for him to get done. He did what God had determined. In other words, there was a purpose for David's life in the first place now Jesus referred to this kind of knowledge knowing what the Lord is doing that's what we're talking about he referred to this kind of knowledge when he said to his disciples on the night of his betrayal henceforth I call you not servants for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I've made known to you. I've told you what the Father's doing. Servants don't have that privilege. <laughs> They're just told, go plow the field. They're not told why. 
All right, that's the principle that Paul's dealing with here. <clears throat> to the intent that now, now meaning since Jesus has been exalted. Yes, Brother Aaron. You know, when we say my intent is that to do whatever it is, that phrase makes provision for the uncontrollable. My intent is this. That's allowing for there's something yeah, out of my control. Right. But, but this is my intent. But when the Lord says, he uses the same word, his intent, he's declaring yeah. what will happen. That's so right. That only he can say, I will do all my pleasure. That's right. He, he has the power to carry it out and the wisdom to carry it out. Yeah, ours is, a, it's almost a hope so. Unless, unless you're intending to do what God tells you to do, then you throw yourself into it, it'll be done. And that now, now since G's been exalted, now that we're in the day of salvation. Before we move on from that point, I was thinking about that. It's because the reason we have to have a qualifier on our intentions is because we're not the only one working things out. That's right. But Amen. God is. Amen. So when he has an intention, he's the one carrying it out with all the resources to do so. That's why we say the Lord willing. Mm -hmm. The Lord willing. See, there, there's that will again. Because he's revealed, I work all things according to my will. So if the Lord's will, then we'll, we will do, the Lord willing, I'll go into the city and buy this and that and do this and that if the Lord wills. Now that Jesus is exalted, here's the intent. I'm making all men see. I'm bringing people to what they can fellowship in the mystery of redemption that involves people that were irreconcilable, being reconciled to one another and to God and working together for the glory of God. Why, why is that happening? To the intent that now, under principalities and powers and heavenly places, might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. <clears throat> so the real objective is not what's being done on earth. <laughs> it's what's being accomplished in heaven. That's the real aim. Well, see, that changes. Now, listen, this changes how you live, how you preach, how you teach. If the real is aim, if the real aim is so that principalities and powers in heavenly places can see God's wisdom, this alters the way I talk, the way I work, the way I live, the way the church functions. This alters everything. Because I will tell you, it's hard to impress these principalities and powers in heavenly places. For the earthly-minded person, this makes no sense. He could care less about what's happening in heaven. In fact, a man once said to me in a public debate, what does heaven have to do with us anyway? Mm. Oh, yeah. Because he thought the main thing is what was going on here. But what's going on here is an order that the main thing may go on there. Amen. Principalities and powers. The focus shifts now, see, to heavenly realms. We've been talking about earth, talking about the church, all this. Now it shifts now, heavenly places. There's something God wanted known in heaven that had not hitherto been known. And some tutelage is going to take place there. Everything's not, everybody in heaven doesn't know everything. Not even these principalities and powers, which are lofty, authoritative personalities. The particular personalities are referred to as principalities and powers. Now, contrary to the teaching of one that I confronted at the, one of the institutions here, these are not the principalities and powers against which we wrestle. That's not who it is. This commentator who lives here in town, teaches here in town, this, com this commentator said that because the same Greek words are used here, principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's used in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle against principalities and powers in heavenly places, that he's talking about that, he's, that those powers we're wrestling against, that's the powers... That God's teaching. Well, I had to correct him in public because it was so wrong. 
These principalities and powers we wrestle against, they can't be taught. They cannot learn. They've been, in the terms of Scripture, bound with everlasting chains of darkness. Darkness referring to ignorance. I mean, they cannot advance in their understanding. Even if God shows them something and, so to speak, puts it down their gullet, they can't understand it. God's locked them out of understanding. And to think that he would institute the great scheme of redemption and plan of salvation to teach fallen angels is one of the greatest absurdities I ever heard. I recommended the man be fired immediately. People who, th and you'd be surprised who thinks this. People who think these things are just wrong. Principles and power. So God hasn't designed anything to teach Satan. Satan never learns. If he's set back, it, he doesn't say, well, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> he just comes back and does it again. He can't learn. God's made it so he can't learn. Principles and powers that work for Satan, they can't learn. These principles and powers we're talking about can. Now, there's a sort of a hierarchy. I'm not sure if these are in the angelic order or not. Some translations refer to it as the angelic order. I'm not sure that they are in the angelic order unless it's just a general celestial spirit, as some have defined it. Angels ordinarily have messages. They're sent with messengers. They're a messenger. But as I understand things, there's a hierarchy of angels. They're not messengers. They don't bring messages. They're principalities and powers. Now that we know of one, falls in this category, Michael the archangel. He has angels. There's not one syllable in scripture that represents Michael as telling a man something. None. Gabriel told Daniel that Michael helped uh, to cast down a principality, evil principality in power, but Michael's not a messenger, he's a prince, he's a ruler. He's not a messenger. These principalities and powers, their chief work is not to deliver messages, their chief work is to rule. They have authority of some, some kind in God's kingdom. And they can, they, they can exercise it. The scriptures speak about one angel had power over water, and one had power over fire, and one had power to bind Satan and cast him in a bit of pit. And shut the door. An angel did that. So there are principles and powers that are very lofty and very high. But as high as they are, there's some things they don't know. They don't know why. God has instituted this great salvation. They, they don't know it hasn't been shared with them because it didn't pertain to them. Something about God himself that must be known by these exalted personalities. And that's about the extent of what we know about these principalities and powers. They're just, that's about all we know about them. We'll know better later. But there's, God's teaching them by the church. <laughs> How's that? Must be a humiliating way to learn for a principality and power to learn. That by the church, the, that's the vehicle by which these uh, lofty personalities will learn about the wisdom of God. One might, might think of the ones to whom the teaching is accomplished, that the, they should be in heaven. <laughs> but in, instead, they're on earth. How's that? How's that for God? To somebody who's working at in the earth, he's teaching pe personnel that are greater than men, infinitely greater than men, he's teaching them by something he's doing in earth and fallen people at once fallen. Amen. By the church. The reason should be obvious. 
It's because the earth is the place where the people are changed. That's where the change takes place in salvation is when they're on earth. That's where they've been washed and sanctified and justified in the earth. That's, that's where they were born again. That's where they became partakers of Christ. That's where they were joined to the Lord, became one spirit with him. That's where the grace of God taught them to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world, all the while looking for the coming, blessed appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The earth is where they're located when Jesus intercedes for them in, the Holy, in heaven, and when the Holy Spirit intercedes for them on earth, all this is going on. They're being changed from glory to glory while they're in the earth. It's just happening while they're in the earth. These people, none of them have the power to do it themselves. They, they can't do this. There's no power on earth, inherent to earth, that can, that can really do this. But it's done by divine wisdom. This thing has been thoroughly thought out. And God is executing his wisdom. He's showing, here's an obstacle. Adam fell. All right, it's an obstacle. Now you could have gone to Gabriel and said, Gabriel, what do you, what do you think, Gabriel? What, what, what do you think we should do? No answer. Go to Michael. What, what, what do you think, Michael? What, what should we do about this? Now here I created man to have dominion. Look here, look here. He's lost it all now. He could have called that whole that congregation of angels together at once and said, huh? how can we resolve this problem? And there would have been no answer. It looked like it was a hopeless situation, which is exactly what God intended for it to be. He didn't start out on this salvation plan until he knew and knew it certain that, so to speak, that there, it would be hopeless, something that couldn't be wrought by anybody else, only by God. I ask you, isn't that a great, <laughs> that's a great thing? Now, it's a, it's a manifold wisdom, multifaceted wisdom, like a prism, like a prism. It has a lot of different sides. Manifold wisdom. Here's some different ways that's translated. The New Revised Version says, the wisdom of God in its rich variety. The Amplified Bible said, many-sided wisdom of God in all of its infinite variety and innumerable aspects. That is to say, there's not a situation God that isn't addressed by salvation. You say, what about unbelief? Well, if it, only if it's continual. Yes. One of the ways that God is making known this manifold wisdom is that salvation is, itself is very complex. That's right. On, on a multitude of levels. It's That's a right. Very complex situation that God created. That's how one of the ways that his manifold wisdom is Amen. You think of man, his mind, his intellect, his emotion, his will, his body, his rational powers. See? All of that's affected. Sin involves all of that. And the adversary, he's he is to shrewdness what God is to omnip omniscience. He's crafty above all beasts of the field, Genesis says it. You can't be matched for subtlety. Then you've got an environment that's going down. Not the, envi the environment itself is going down. It's, it's corruptible. So you've got that happening. And you've got that sin has a stultifying and numbing effect. So that the person is is descending, gradually going down, down, down. And all of this is addressed by salvation to make men, these, these kind of people, to make them see. As Brother Mike has said, it involves a lot of unspeakable wisdom. So if a person says, I just can't do it. They've got to see this truth now we're talking about here. Say, I know I shouldn't do this, but I just can't help it. I just, I, 
They've got to know what we're talking about here. The God's wisdom, what do you mean you can't do it? This you say in salvation doesn't address this little thorny weight and sin that you've got that so easily besets you? Would you dare to affirm that salvation didn't address that matter? God's wisdom has addressed it. But you've got to know about it. See? So when, when the thing that would cast you down, guilt that would throw you down to the ground, see, and rob you of any kind of hope that you could recover, that's offset when you know what God's purpose is. God's saying, look, look at this. <laughs> look at out there, Brother Given. Look, look at there. He's in the helpless case now, isn't he? Angels say, oh, yeah, oh, he, those that are against him are more than those that are for him, Lord. It looks to me like he's like, can't do anything here. Well, he said, but I've made a way of escape. That calls for wisdom, a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So in other words, God's not forcing people into heaven. He's leading them. Amen. See? That's, now, that's marvelous. I think if you're leading through, you could see maybe through a, through some kind of a, a maze. You could think of leading people through a maze, but leading them through a war zone, that's something else. Brother Tony. Sometimes that route seems to be our, our every uh, possible escape. That's right. You know, he's always provided a, a route of escape or a way of escape. Right. That seems to be our route. That's Is right. that, that way he's provided each time for an escape? Amen. Stay on the road. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That, now that's that's the that's the objective in the hands of salvation. I wouldn't say it's the only one, but it's it's a very primary one. It's got to be addressed by salvation. The, the principles and powers might be made known by the church. In other words, the church is a college for angels. This is a postgraduate work. The angels they've seen the creation. That's the elementary work. <laughs> They've, they've seen the working with Israel. All right, there's a, there's a high school work. But now we're going to go to postgraduate stuff. We're going to go to some heavier, heavier things now. And by the church, we're going to show you God's manifold wisdom. And they'll pick up on it. Now, all of this is according to, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. According to. That expression is used 102 times from Acts through Revelation, according to. It explains why something's being done or the principle upon which it's founded. So we read phrases like, according to the flesh. Okay, so that got, tells you where it comes from. Or we read, according to his ability. See? Or, according to the spirit of holiness. That Jesus raised from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness. Or, according to the grace of God. That accounts for what was done. Or, according to the promise, Galatians 3.26. The phrase, according to, is found... I believe it's 15 times in the book of Ephesians alone. Why? Because he's explaining the cause. He's explaining what, what drives the thing, what causes it to happen. Paul is here opening up this uh, objective. The church is the circumference <coughs> of divine wisdom that is being specifically displayed. He's not showing them creation. That was stretched out by wisdom, too. The Lord created the world by wisdom. That's what the scriptures say. But that, he's not, that's, not, that's not where this wisdom we're talking about, her manifold wisdom, that's not being displayed in the creation. There was wisdom displayed in, in Israel being chosen or Noah being spared. Now, that's not the way. It's by the church. What's happened to the church? That's the kind of wisdom he's displaying to principalities 
and power. So the church is a circumference. Some of the areas involve justification of sinners. All right, that's quite a quite a work, brethren. Or the reconciliation of alienated people. Or the sanctifying of unclean people. Or changing of that which is unacceptable. <laughs> See, these are all displays of God's wisdom. Grafted in the Gentiles. Grafted in the Gentiles, that's right. The individuals through which this wisdom is being made known are not men like Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, or Cyrus. They were used by God, but they weren't exhibits of the kind of wisdom we're talking about here, even though they were used by God. This is uh, an eternal purpose, which is not that an intriguing phrase. The, etern the eternal purpose, not purposes, the eternal purpose. <laughs> This purpose involves men, but it's higher than men. <laughs> First, you've got to see that. It's an eternal purpose, like the eternal God, which means it's part of God himself. Amen. It's part of his constitution, if I may use that term. There never was a time God didn't have this purpose. It's always been, he's, it's always been part of him. You say, well, that's hard to understand. Well, indeed, this is an eternal God we're talking about. He transcends human understanding. He's called the eternal God. Now we, have, we find he has an eternal purpose. So this purpose wasn't conceived after he surveyed what was going to happen on earth. So it was eternal purpose before the earth was, before the foundation, before the plans for the earth were laid. This purpose existed. The purpose, again, to teach these principalities and powers about his manifold wisdom. So how? I'm much wiser than they can see. I mean, these principalities and powers have seen my wisdom in a lot of things that took place, like the casting out of Satan and things we do not know. But I, that's, uh, my wisdom extends a lot further than that. Let's see. How can I teach I'm going to conceive, I'm going to create a race that's vulnerable and I'm going to let the arch foe that fell do whatever he wants on that race. And when he's knocked them down and they've fallen short of the glory of God, they look irrecoverable, I'm going to fit them for glory. Amen. That's the kind of wisdom. Ran righteous. Ran righteous is Amen. <laughs> God's eternal purpose is inherent in his nature so he can't be properly understood unless they have some kind of understanding of this purpose because that's part, part of him if eternal life is knowing God and this is part of God then this is something that's got to be known his eternal purpose to some extent I think we can safely say you'll never be satisfied thoroughly with the extent of your knowledge of the eternal purpose, but you'll at least have your hand on it and be able to work with it. If you're if you're positive God has set an objective and He's going to it's going to be done, then it's a lot easier to involve yourself, so to speak, in what God is doing, and to actually insightfully pray. Thy will be done on earth Amen. as it is in heaven. In us. Do it, Father. Yeah, Jesus, when he said, All the Father made known to me, I made known to you. That was in order to carry their role out in the kingdom so the principalities and powers could see how wise God was. You know, one of the things ascribed to God in Revelation is wisdom, wisdom and power. Wisdom is one of the things ascribed to God that's going to be seen in the wrap-up of salvation. <clears throat> and I said, but why, why is it really necessary to know this purpose, to have some kind of adequate understanding of it? Why? Well, my brethren, this is part of God, right? This is part of God. So knowing God involves this purpose. 
when you realize that when Jesus comes, all that know not God are going to be destroyed, well, that changes how you look at this. That changes how you look at this. You mean tell me that I'll be condemned if I don't know God's purpose? That's not what I'm, I'm saying. You're gambling if you don't know it. It's a sort of a form of gambling because God's put it within your reach. God sent an apostle to make it to open our eyes, to make, make us to see it, see, to understand it. So if we don't understand it, then the main thing would be discontent with that situation and press in and they'd pray like David, give me understanding. Just, just say that to God. I want to see what, what's been said. <coughs> I know this has been said. <coughs> I'm having a hard time grasping it. Well, Paul said, consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Then, then take this to the Lord and don't think God won't open it up to you. Amen. Because God wants to be known. He wants to be known. It says of Jesus that God gave all things into his hand. Now, he knew that. That's why he went about his ministry. See, he knew what, what, what God intended. Again, he said, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God, and he just proceeded on. In, the, in that knowledge, he proceeded on. You will do the same thing. When you see what God has intended, and you really do it, it you kind of you see it's kind of like you see the border of it, you see the outline of it. It bolsters your confidence. All of a sudden, you say, "Well, I'm going to I'm going to sally forth," as you say, into the battle and uh, fight the good fight of faith. <coughs> the Father will sustain you. It's no wonder that God has purposed his eternal purpose in Christ. Now, he's very careful. He says that he puts, he purposed in Christ. He purposed it in Christ. What does that mean? After the whole thing had been designed, and it's like in a package, he gave it to Jesus. So here it is. You work it out. You're the administrator of this purpose. So you draw him. You guide him. You, you're the captain of the salvation. You're bringing them home to glory. You're the one in charge of this. You're the author. You're the finisher. Here's what I'm doing. Make it happen, son. Then you submit yourself to the son. He'll make it happen in you. Now, Jesus said one time <coughs> in Matthew 11, he said, No man knows who the father is. No one knows who the son is but the father. And no man knows who the father is but the son and he to whom he wills to reveal him. Matthew eleven twenty seven. So a person may say, yeah, but what if that's not me? Well, I mean, what, what if Jesus doesn't want to reveal him to me? Well, the next verse says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, learn from me. I will give you rest unto your souls. See, so what it is, Jesus will reveal this to anyone who wants it. It's just, it's just that it's just that gloriously gloriously simple. And the job the job of uh, us among one another is to help each other want it. Amen. That's why we don't spend our time testifying what we were. Because after we talk about it for a while, it kind of casts us down too. We'd rather talk about what God has made us and what He's intending and what it does. What do you do? You testify of this and it bolsters your, bolsters your courage and you press in confident because you know if God be for us, I mean, who can be against us? Amen. Once you see this, you know, well, what can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, tribulation and all this, it can't separate us. Why? Because God's already determined what's going to be done. My job is get in the flow, get in the flow. You're like the eagles, you know, who fly in the currents up high. Airplanes do too. Aircraft fly 700 mile an hour in current, but hardly burn any fuel at all. Because the currents. You ever think how much fuel it would take to fly across a several thousand mile ocean? I don't think you can put enough fuel in a plane. 
But it gets up there in the car and doesn't stop burning fuel. It's just all the fuel does just kind of keep it off the ground. Just in the current. There's a spiritual current. If you get up high enough, there's a spiritual current just carry you along. It'll take the tediousness out of a spiritual life and put the joy into it, see? And that comes by knowing what what God's doing in salvation. So you run and not grow weary. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Envision quite a long, lengthy race I envision there. Yeah. And the Lord is our strength. That's right. Amen. Amen. And if you have anything you'd like to add, yes, Ricky. Knowledge of this truth has actually given me a lot of strength in different kinds of temptations I've faced <laughs> because at the root of <clears throat> sin is selfishness. Yeah. The person is centered on themselves, they're vulnerable. Yeah. He's exceedingly vulnerable to sin. But when you see that salvation isn't primarily about you and that it's about God's glory and that it's not. It's about principalities and powers in places that aren't even in the earth that are learning about it. It encourages you to get outside of yourself. Don't think about yourself so much in your own circumstances yeah. and realize there are greater repercussions to your actions than even what it does to you. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yes, brother. It's God's desire to bless. Bless men and yeah. bless all, right. all living creatures. Amen. And Amen. Uh, and when you can see when you can see God. Then you, you're blessed by this. He knows. He reveals himself to, and we're and we're blessed by it. Just it's a glorious aspect. Amen. Of him being God. I was thinking when you're talking to him, that God's so big, you know that his uh, his purpose is going to just be uh, seeing God is going to is going to be eternal thing. Amen. And he has no no beginning, no end. You have God has a will and God has a nature too. So he wills you to save men. Now you have this complicating factor that men are filled with iniquity, which offends God. Only God could work around, or shall I say, only God could address that, that circumstance satisfactorily. Only God could actually take away the sin without compromising his own character. Take it away and judge it, then return to the one and conform him to his image. See, that that's God's wisdom. God does that. And God wants to do it. Yeah, it's, it's a blessing to be able to see that, that the wisdom of God. You hear uh, of, you know, people say today, well, everybody has a little good in them. Actually, we were born into sin. That's right. So there was no good. There was no man. No man was good. So the fact that even one person is saved is it is it's not even possible, but God made the impossible possible through Christ Jesus. Amen. The wisdom that He is He's showing here it is yeah. it's incredible. Well, you ask yourself the question: If you have seen that wisdom is what saved you, maybe maybe you don't see it yet, but if you've seen it. You, you know how much it took yeah. for for you to see that, and you just you just see the under you're just seeing the underside of salvation. Think of what what's seen in heavenly places. Yeah. about this about the battle that we're in and how like just like maybe Paul and the ones who are on the front line and they're you know getting yeah. the, the deceit out of the way and then we're yes. we enter in that too you know because right. we got to all be able to see so uh it's very good it makes you you know know that you need to continue to exhort one another and to be able to help us to yeah. keep our minds to be able to see and it's not that we're uh preaching to everyone which we are preaching to everyone too but yeah. To those that see, the main focus is to help the saints to get the glory. That's right. And you know, in the world, in the world, armies to establish a beachhead, the people who establish the beachhead are generally considered expendable. Generally, generally, they're generally written off. People sent out to recapture a hill or whatever. But in the kingdom of God, <laughs> that's not the way it works. Those who establish the beachhead are not expendable. So their works do follow them when they see 
you won't want to see that. That's a glorious thing to see. That the person who exposes himself to more jeopardy isn't more likely to fail. God will cause him to stand, see, right in the midst of all that. Well, wisdom is what does that. Earlier when we talked about the complexity of salvation, <laughs> it seemed like God has piled up every possible thing you could think of against yeah. The possibility of salvation. That's right. Uh, our fallen nature, Satan working yeah. against us, this environment, you just name it. And the it's there, the but still, right. <laughs> and we're still uh, being saved. Amen. That'd be a good thing. Just it's, it's put on sometimes the things that stand against you being saved. Then peruse them and start thanking God. <laughs> yeah. There are some things <clears throat> that can't be learned without uh, being seen. Like some things you can you can transmit some information just by telling someone. There's other things you've got to see it to really understand yeah. it. And that's how, how our fellowship with God is. Uh, for example, uh, the, the text, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And you... You can tell someone that, and they'll say, oh, well, that sounds nice, and yeah, you yeah. might put it on a greeting card or something <laughs> like that, but when you've, when you've lived uh, long yeah. enough to yeah. experience some things yeah. and you've, you've learned that by experience, well, then you really know it. That's right. Or Jesus promising the, the Holy Spirit would come and guide you into all truth. That's another thing. Someone can tell you that, but you don't really know it until you recognize the Spirit's work mm. in your own self. Mm -hmm. Well, this is how it is with uh, God revealing to the heavenly host. Mm -hmm. He could have just said, "I'm wise." <laughs> well, what, you know, what would they have learned from yeah, that? Sir, so, he's he's revealing his wisdom by what he's doing, and he's doing it in a very wonderful mm -hmm. and complex way. <clears throat> I've, I've heard people talk about God this way. I mean, he's omniscient. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. And they just rattle things off, and I get the idea that it's just it's too academic. Now, if you, really, if you really live by faith and walk by faith, you've got to have a God that is all this. But, but seeing it or comprehending it or discerning it or perceiving it, that's something else. Is Mary? I was just thinking the perception comes from that. Holding on with the faith. That's good. That's you just good. Hang on to it. You got it in possession. Yeah. <laughs> I know whom I believed. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Kevin, yes. I really appreciate this emphasis that you continue to put on of how it's God. He's the one who's doing this. It's not all about us. And as I'm continuing to see more, I see that how potent this idea of man being the yeah. center is. But the thing about the truth is it's able to correct your wrong views, and it changes everything. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah, it shows you, too, that the closer you are to God, the more God wants you to know. So here's these personalities surrounding the throne. The ignorance can't exist in that state there. But the irony is, see, that he's teaching them by something from the lower <laughs> From the lower realm, so it'd be like it'd be like a PhD going back to kindergarten and picking up a few valuable principles. Well, this doesn't happen on earthly level, but his wisdom is it had he had to start out with a lowly creature and then and develop and up up develop him against all reason and against all odds. He had to develop that individual so that they reflected his glory. That took wisdom. Amen. Yes, Judah. I like the example that you gave of <coughs> eagles flying on air currents. And I thought if I've flown on airplanes above a storm and you look up out the window, up at the blue sky and white clouds and then down and you can see the dark clouds yeah. And you know the rain is probably falling below the clouds, but you have to get through the storm to be on that current. That's right. Amen. When Amen. we're on the current, yeah. with flying with wings as eagles, 
we can look down at the trials that we went through to get there Amen. because Satan will try to hinder us from going there. Mm -hmm. And we can see that there were a small thing and God can bring us there. Yeah. It's important that no one, no one missed it. When we talk about in this current or living with joy and this sort of thing, that that all pertains to one's perception of God, not of self or circumstance. It's the perception of God that enlightens everything else. Amen. Yes? You know, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea of purpose and kind of like what's already been said, but um, we, we're we so focused or taught to be so focused on like finding our purpose. What's our purpose? Like, so we <laughs> choose the best career or do the right things so that God can really use us. Yeah. And to me, that seems really man-centered and selfish. It is man-centered, yes. And, um, <laughs> and I'm thinking we put a lot of emphasis and a lot of worry in making the right decisions yeah. so that we can find what is God's will. And to, it almost seems to me like if we're being faithful and we're being obedient and we're putting it in God's hands and trusting Him, that whether we choose <coughs> door A or door B, well, isn't He going to bless that? I mean... It's not that we have to figure out what his will is. That's right. That almost seems impossible <laughs> sometimes to us. Well, it is frustrating. Yeah, and it's frustrating. And also, you know, I've sat in a church before where we went through the purpose of stuff. <laughs> I hated it then, but I didn't realize why. And I'm starting to really understand why I just had this sickening feeling during the whole thing, and I, I refused to participate in it. I remember, <laughs> and, and everyone was really upset with me, but I was just like, this just can't be right. Because I remember going through this whole purpose driven studies and all this, and then they brought us into the gymnasium and they said, okay, the grand finale was take you through all these different committees and you've got to sign up for five of them. And I'm thinking, yeah. really? This is my purpose? Because I thought the Bible said that I'm to minister to my husband and my kids and obey God when he tells me. Not sign up for a bunch of committees. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, I don't remember ever being taught, you know what, God has this eternal purpose. I don't remember ever being taught about his purpose. Well, you, you see it I remember being taught a lot about finding my purpose. Yeah, I, and it seems so selfish to me, yes. so man-centered. It wasn't satisfying. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I was in the, in the manufacturing world, they had classes, you know, you had to go to have create an incentive in that, and they had to, I noticed that if they were three days, four days, however, I noticed that the first day, the teacher pretty well exhausted everything they had to say, and it was a routine of some sort, and it looked, it looked pretty good, but you, if you, you couldn't go through it more than two weeks, and it just, it didn't work, no. see, and that's the that's what you experienced, it, it, these pl plans on paper <coughs> to an unlearned person, <clears throat> they look pretty good, but they don't work. That's that's the, you got to go back and get a refresher course or come to next year's seminar. Yeah. They don't work, yeah. but see what God does does work, and it, it addresses God's God's direction will be flushed out in all of these choices that challenge people and bother them. They'll know what to do. They'll see the right opportunities. And recognize it. Maybe they'll have, they have to do a little preparation or something like that. We don't deny that, but they'll have this confidence that there were. It is confident, but it takes a lot of the pressure off when you figure oh. out how Jesus oh, yes. attach yourself to his plan. Yeah. Or attach yourself to his purpose while well, he attaches you to his purpose. That's right. Mm -hmm. And go along for the ride. <laughs> <Yeah>, religious, <laughs> a religious system of any kind that leaves the people frustrated or discouraged. This is working against what God's doing. See, but but it, because you're always it's out there someplace. I don't know where it is, but we're we're going to keep on going, and maybe a couple more installments we'll get there. But this isn't how this this isn't how God leads people. He he brings you to a point where you see something, then you're able to go a little further. You see something else, you're able to go a little further, and you do it joyfully, and it makes it makes you smarter in the things of God. You're able to see this is evil, this is right, and which has a great deal to do with the choices that you make. But if you don't know, if you don't know, 
This is what God's targeting. This doesn't fit in with it. See, there are some, some occupations that a child of God just can't do. I held a meeting in, I think it was Wisconsin, someplace. Sister June is with me, and a man had just converted. was in a Reformed church. A man had just been converted, and he drove a beer truck. That was his job. And he said while he was there, no one said anything. I didn't know he drove a beer truck. No one said anything about driving beer trucks. But during that meeting, he came and said, you know, he said, I can't, I can't drive this truck anymore. It all came to him. Why? Because he got in the light, see, and the light shone on that occupation. He said, this, this can't be right. And he came to the conclusion. Now, he, you, there's no course you could teach a person to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Okay. 